Kunis T. How are ye? Welcome to the Candle of Tales podcast. Welcome to week two of our collaboration with the Embers Collective, Echoes. This week, you're going to hear two stories, a story from the Embers Collective, and then after that, a story from Irish myth chosen by one of our storytellers. We're going to talk about these stories all at once in a post-show special at the end of the month. So keep an eye on our social media for details. But for now, settle in and let Sarah tell us the story of the devil's violin. So there was this girl and she was a bit strange. She was a kind of girl who was always on the edge of things. Never in the middle, always lurking about on the edge. That's where she was right now. Standing on the edge of her village square, staring at this man. Not blinking. Because that is how much she liked him. She liked him a lot. She'd liked him for ages. She thought he was the best man in the village. He had the best hair. Objectively. It hung in perfect curls and swirls around his face. He had the best eyes. They gleamed like green glass. The best nose, the best words came out of his face. And every time she saw him, her whole body tingled with pleasure. But the man wasn't bothered. Even though the girl spent quite a lot of her time trying to engineer herself directly into his eyeline, he never saw her. He didn't notice her. And so the girl thought, I must do something about this dynamic. And so she went into the forest because she'd heard that can help. And she got on her knees and she tilted her face up to the sky and she chanted those old words, those ancient powerful songs. So as the moon rolls away from its mother and returns, let this man turn to me. So as a pine needle brushes up against another in a pine tree, let this man brush up against me. So as a flower opens its petals to the sun, let this man open himself to me. And then she got up and she ran out of the forest to see if it had worked. And it hadn't. And so she went back in. She got on her knees again. And she cried. She beat her breast with her fists. She sobbed and screamed. She scratched into that forest floor with her nails, past the topsoil, past the middle soil, past that dark, rich bottom soil, deeper and deeper and deeper and to oh! She got to the devil. All cosy in a little hollow in the ground. And the devil looked up and he saw the girl's fingers beckoning and he reached his hands to hers and landed lightly beside her, brushing the earth of his smart black suit, pricking up his horns. And then the devil looked at the girl and he said, hmm, what do you want? And the girl looked at the devil and she said, you know what I want. And the devil said, sure, but what will you do? And the girl looked at the devil and said, I will do anything. And then the devil smiled and he said, well, that is music to my ears. Go home and bring me back the thing that gives you the most joy. And so the girl went home. She went into her house and she looked at all the stuff that was in it. You know, the chairs and the tables and the ornaments, little bits of brick and brack, but... None of it really gave her any joy. She thought, why? Why do we have all this stuff if it doesn't bring us joy? And then she heard this chuckle. And when she turned around, she saw her father, his great broad back and shoulders shaking with mirth, probably laughing at one of his own jokes. And she said, father, you give me the most joy. Oh. Will you come with me into the forest? And the father 
took his daughter's hand, and he walked with her through the trees until they got to the devil, and the devil smiled and clicked his fingers. And the girl's father was gone. All that was left of him were the bones of his torso and just a little bit of his neck. And the devil took those bones and he sculpted them into a hollow box that went in and out and then he varnished it and he polished it and the girl said, Oh, my father's bones have never shone so bright. And then the devil said, Do you still want this man? And the girl said, I do. Then go home and bring me the thing that gives you the most strength. And the girl ran home. And as soon as she stepped into the yard of her house, she saw her mother drawing up water from the well. And the girl said, Mother, you give me the most strength. Come with me into the forest. And the mother took her daughter's hand and they ran through the trees towards the devil. He smiled and clicked his fingers. And the girl's mother was gone. All that was left of her were the bones of her spine and her long grey silvery hair and the devil took them and he stretched them into a long gleaming bow and the girl said, oh, my mother's bones have never danced so light and the devil looked at the girl and he said, do you still want this man? And the girl said, I do, and go home and bring what gives you the most hope and the most despair and she raced home and as soon as she got there she saw them right away her little brother and sister playing together, pinching and poking each other. And she said, oh, it is you. Definitely, you give me the most hope and the most despair. Come with me into the forest. She took their hands. They ran together. The devil laughed, clicked his fingers twice. And her brother and sister were gone. All that was left of them were their guts and their tongues. And the devil stretched them as strings over that hollow box of bone and they tinged and they pinged and the girl said oh my brothers and sisters voices have never sounded so sweet and then the devil took that strange instrument and he put it underneath the girl's chin he put the bow in her hand and he said now play and the girl brought the bow down upon the strings and because it doesn't matter who you are or what your violin's made of the first time you try and play it, it sounds disgusting but the devil instructed her and say what you like about the devil and a lot of people do he is an excellent teacher And the girl worked. You know, she practiced really hard. She was committed. Or should have been committed. She rehearsed until the bones in her arms ached. Until the tips of her fingers were split with red blood. She was so focused on what she was doing, she almost forgot what she was doing it for. And spring became summer, became autumn, became winter, became spring again. And then... She was playing so sweet and light that the branches of the trees bent in closer to hear her, that the birds paused mid song in the air, that the butterflies fluttered their wings as quietly as they could so they didn't miss a note. And she took that music out of the forest and into the village. And when the people heard that sound, you know, full of joy and strength and hope and despair, they left their jobs. They left their kids, they poured out of their houses and when she played fast they danced, shaking their limbs loose. And when she played slow they stood in trance, tears slipping down their cheeks. They threw gold and silver and the clothes off their own backs and that man, that man who hadn't noticed her before, he noticed her now. He noticed her all the way home. He noticed her as she wrapped that violin in a silken cloth, put it in a case and fastened the clasp. He noticed her as she walked towards him, gold and silver falling from her hands and said, everything that I have can be yours. My house, my wealth, myself, because I think you are the best man in the village. And then she lifted her lips to his, but just before they met, she said, 
but not my violin. Don't touch my violin. And then they kissed. And then they made love. And then they lay together in bed in each other's arms and the girl ran her fingers through that man's curling, swirling hair and she drifted off to dreams. Her body tingling with pleasure. But the man couldn't sleep. You know what it's like when you're in a strange bed after you've just made love to a strange girl. And so he slipped out of the bed and he walked out of the room and there lying on the floor illuminated by a shaft of moonlight from the window almost like it was doing it on purpose was a violin in its case don't touch the violin I'm not thought the man I'm just looking at the case he unfastened the clasps don't touch the violin I am not. I'm merely unfastening the clasps. He unfolded the silken cloth. Don't touch the violin. I am not. I am just unfolding this silken cloth. He picked up the violin. Okay, yes. I am now, in fact, touching the violin. But I'm not going to play it because I am not stupid. And he didn't. But he pretended. He struck a pose. He skimmed the bow in the air above the strings and he imagined those people in front of him. Dancing, laughing, weeping, cheering and chanting his name. Oh my God, it was intoxicating. He could almost hear their voices. Father's bones. Whispering. Mother's. Bones, whispering, brothers and sisters, guts and tongues, whispering, father's bones, mother's bones, brothers and sisters, guts and tongues, father's bones, mother's bones, brothers and sisters, guts and tongues, father's bones, mother's bones, brothers and sisters, guts and tongues, and a drop of blood fell from the bow onto the man's fingers and another drop spilled onto the collar of his shirt and he quickly went and he wrapped the violin back in the cloth, he put it in the case, he fastened the clasp and he ran to the bathroom and he scrubbed at the blood on his fingers and he scrubbed at the blood on his shirt but that kind of blood just does not come out even though he scrubbed and he scrubbed until the sun rose the next morning and what are you doing? The girl stood in the doorway all sleepy and smiley but when she saw the blood staining the man her smile froze as he backed away from her turning pale and he said you are a monster you are a murderer you are the devil's child and the girl said oh I'm so sorry that that is how you are choosing to look at it that is such a shame do you know what that is really disappointing because I thought you were the best man in the village and you don't understand at all and the man said I will tell the village I will tell everyone who you are and what you have done and he pushed past her and he ran out of the house and the girl cried one tear because that was all she had left in her and then she went and got the violin out of the case she polished the body, she resined the bow, she tuned the strings and she walked out of her house and she played. Sweet and soft to start with, you know, little notes that just dusted the air and the people stepped out of their houses smiling. And then she played smooth, round tones that made the people sway on their feet where they stood. And then she started playing so fierce and fast and bright, her fingers like quicksilver on the strings, that the people just stood transfixed in awe. Until the man turned up. 
He barged through the people in the village square. He went up to the girl. He grabbed the bow from her hand and the music stopped. And the man turned to the people and he told them what he had seen, what he had found out, how the girl had come by that violin and all of the people stared at the man. And then all of the people stared at the girl. And then all of the people... And the girl turned to the man. She said, oh dear. Well, now look what you've done. You've upset everyone. What am I going to do with you? And then she smiled. And she looked just past the man's shoulder. And when the man turned, he saw that there was another man standing really close to him in a very smart black suit with intense burning eyes and little horns. And the girl said, oh yes, now that's a good idea. Click! She bent down and picked up her bow from where it had fallen to the ground. She put the violin back underneath her chin, but now, just past where her fingers held the neck, there was this wooden scroll carved in a perfect curl. And she brought the bow back down upon the strings and the music swirled around the people in the village square and they started to move and dance and cheer and chant as the girl played on and the girl played on and the girl played on. Well, when Rue O'Shea heard this story, the parallel for him was the great hook they share, a magical musical instrument that when played tells a dark secret. Both of these stories share a similar tone, that of a sinister fairy tale. The story of the King of Donkey's Ears is often presented as a harmless story for children, so Rue added back in the darker aspects of this king's early life to make things suitably sinister. In this telling of King Lowry Lynchuk. There was once a king of Leinster by the name of Larry Lork. Now, Larry appeared to have everything from the outside. He reigned over a prosperous land, he was a wealthy man, his subjects were happy, and he had a son on the way. However, when the child was born, an odd shadow, a sense of secrecy that had never been there before, appeared to grow over the royal household and the child was never seen in public for the first year of its life. After that year elapsed, then the child was seen in public and everything seemed perfectly normal except he had hair that was unusually long, thick and matted. A very unkempt appearance for a future king. However, other than this, everything appeared to be perfectly normal this child would grow up to inherit the throne and that odd shadow of secrecy seemed to be dissipating. However, as one shadow diminished, another one grew. The king had a brother. His name was Cahok. And Cahok had the unfortunate trait of being the jealous type. Needless to say, Cahok was deeply jealous of his brother, the king. The king's every prosperity, every victory, made Cahok feel less than, made Cahok feel as though it was a slight against him personally somehow. And this jealousy ate at Cahok. It made him thin and pale and gaunt. It ran through him like a poison and made him toxic. It even earned him a new nickname, 
Kahak, quail. Kahak, the miserable. And Kahak quail also had a son whose name was Melig. Melig often found solace in his cousin, the king's son, as they would play together, a distraction from Kahak's increasing sickness and strangeness, a distraction from the fact that Kahak appeared to be wasting away to his death. One day, these cousins were out playing together, as they often did, when, all of a sudden, the king went rushing by. Fear and worry were etched deep into his pale face as he headed towards the house of Kahak Quail. If ever there was a doubt of the king's love for his brother, it was removed in this moment and the two cousins looked at each other fearfully. They sat together for what seemed like an age and eventually a royal guard approached them. They looked to each other trembling, expecting Melig to be summoned to hear the news of his father's death that Ka Quail had finally wasted away. However, to their surprise, it wasn't Melig, but the king's son, who was summoned to Kahak Quail's house. Perplexed, the child followed the guard. They entered into Kahak Quail's bedroom, and there was indeed a corpse on that bed, but it was not the corpse of Kahak Quail, but that of the king. The bed was blood-strewn. The king's chest had been cut right open and standing above him was Cog Quail with a smile on his thin lips and the heart of the king in his hand. The door was bolted shut. Cog Quail, having committed one heinous act, was prepared to commit another and the king's son was forced to eat his father's heart. From that day on, the child had a new name, Muel, meaning mute, because that's what he'd become. Not a word would pass this child's lips. And Kaha Quail was happy that the child could remain alive. Nobody with a defect such as muteness could ever be a king in Ireland. However, this was a mistake on the part of Caha Quail, as this child would grow up to become the King of Leinster. His muteness would be overcome spontaneously in the heat of a hurling match one day when he shouted out in full voice and gained yet another new name, Lowry. Lowry meaning he speaks. And the tale of how Lowry Lynchuk gain the kingship of Leinster is a good tale if you have a strong stomach and an appreciation for the macabre. Suffice to say for now that it involves Lowry going abroad, amassing a strong following over time and returning with them to Leinster. And suffice to say that Caw Quail and his army were invited into a house, ostensibly for negotiations. And suffice to say, these negotiations never occurred. Beneath the wooden facade of this house, it was secretly built of iron. The doors were bolted, a flame was lit, and Cock and his men were cooked alive. And cooked alongside them was Lowry Lynchock's own mother, who sacrificed herself to lead a suspicious Caw Quail into the Iron House. And so Lowry Lynchock became the King of Leinster. On the surface, his was a successful reign. Things were, by and large, prosperous and peaceful. But just below the surface, there was a fear of this king who had been forced to eat his father's heart as a child who had burned his predecessor alive and who, ever since, 
seemed capable of enacting a callous act without flinching. For members of a particular profession, this fear was not below the surface. It was very much active and terrifying. The barbers of Leinster were very scared of King Lowry and for good reason. Ever since he was a child, Lowry Lynchock's hair was long and thick and matted, strangely so, for a person in his position. Once a year, a barber in Leinster would be called upon to give the king's hair a light trimming and the barber would do so cutting the hair just enough to tame it slightly and then that barber would be put to death nobody knew why and nobody dared to challenge the king's power the barbers of Leinster lived in fear that they would be the next one to be called upon and the people of Leinster wondered just what else this king was capable of. There was a barber named Aena who lived a humble existence with his mother, a poor widow. One day, there came a knock on the door. The widow answered and her heart sank and her pulse raced to find two grim-faced royal guards standing there. They were there to bring her son Aena to cut the king's hair, there and then, no questions. She pleaded and she begged, she wept, and she tried to drag her son out of their grip, but the guards ignored her and shoved her back and escorted Aena to the king. Aena's mother followed. She burst into the royal courtyard and flung herself before King Lowry. The guards moved upon her, ready to fling her out, when, to their surprise, the king stopped them. His normally cold eyes appeared softened by this woman's passion. Lowry's own mother had been willing to make the ultimate sacrifice for him. He found he somehow related to this woman, not only saw the outward expression of her grief, but almost felt it himself as though he had somehow the capacity to put himself into her shoes and feel what she was feeling. It was a bit of an uncomfortable moment for King Lowry, but he decided he would like for this woman, this heartbroken mother, to not feel such pain. He told her that an exception would be made, just this one time, just for her son. He would live on the strict condition that he would never utter a word of what he would see while carrying out his duty of cutting the king's hair. Aina's mother thanked the king profusely, weeping her gratitude and eventually allowed herself to be led outside to wait for her son. And eventually, Aina came back out. His mother embraced him joyfully, but he could only manage a thin smile in return. He seemed perturbed, detached. She prepared a hearty meal for him when he got home, but he could only push the food about his plate before going up to bed with an Irish good night. That is, none at all. Aena was the only living soul who knew the king's secret. He wanted to speak it so badly, but he could not. The weight of it burdened him. He stopped eating altogether. He barely slept. He was growing so gaunt that his mother began to fear that she would lose him after all. One night, she knelt beside him as he languished unhappily in his bed. She gently whispered to him that, although he couldn't tell anyone the secret, Perhaps, if he whispered it to the trees of the forest, he could find some relief. And so that night, under the stairs, Aina wrenched himself from his sickbed. He dragged himself out of the house and into the forest. And deep in the heart of that forest, with the sound of the leaves whispering in the wind, he found an enormous 
ancient willow tree. Aena dropped to his knees, touching the bark, and he quietly whispered the secret to the tree. And when he stood back up, he was surprised to find himself instantly lighter on his feet, as though he had shed a physical burden. Aena almost skipped home, grateful at last to be yet alive. Some time passed. A musician named Kraftana walked into the same forest. He needed to build himself a new harp, one worthy of being played at a great banquet that King Lowry was about to throw. He came into the heart of the forest where the wind whispered through the trees and Kraftana found an enormous ancient willow tree. He smiled. This wood was beautiful. It would do nicely. Kraftana felled the tree and crafted his new harp from it. The banquet was a superb spectacle with the finest of food and wine flowing all night. King Lowry knew how to ingratiate himself to the people who counted most, the nobility which surrounded him that night. After everybody had eaten their fill, he called expectantly upon Kraftana to entertain them. Kraftana, with confidence, took his new harp up to the top of the hall. A hush descended as he began to play. The notes rang out from the willow harp, loud, clear and magical, resonating through the hallway and enchanting the guests. King Lowry sat back, nodding his approval, until he heard something strange. It sounded like the sound of leaves whispering in a windy forest. The sound grew louder. Kraftner played on, perplexed, though feeling as though he couldn't stop. Stranger still, now everybody could hear words singing out from the willow harp, matching the melody that was being played. These words grew louder and louder too until they resonated through the hall for all to hear. Two horses ears on Lowry Lynn Shock. 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 Kraftena finished the tune. There was a deafening silence. All eyes slowly raised themselves up towards King Lowry Lynchuk. Lowry looked about. His secret had been exposed. He lifted his hand up to his famously thick, long hair and pulled it aside to gasps all around. Two horse's ears protruded from his head. The king began to laugh. (laughs) All of his life, this secret had weighed upon him with constant efforts to conceal it. A king could have no defects. His late father had feared that he would never gain the throne because of his ears. And yet, here he was. King of all Leinster, throwing a great feast with his horse's ears in full view of all the nobility. His kingship was secure. The weight of his secret was lifted. It was a pity for all those barbers, probably, he supposed. But he was king. And he continued to laugh. Everybody in the hall, through gritted teeth, and churning stomachs laughed along with him. King Lowry saw the upward curves of their lips, knowing that this meant his subjects were on his side. He considered himself quite good at reading these things in others. Word spread far and wide about the king's ears. The news travelled so far that they even reached the ears of a hermit named Melig. 
who had been living in exile for fear of his life ever since his father, Caha Quail, had been burnt to death by his cousin, King Lowry. Melek had been biding his time for a very long time, waiting on his chance for vengeance. The people of Leinster may fear Lowry Lynchock, but Melek had lost all fear. One day, while the king was out hunting, stalking his prey, the king himself was being stalked. Melek approached Lowry Lynchock from behind, grabbed him, whispered into those horses' ears, and cut the king's throat. This podcast was edited by Oshin Ryan, Rory O'Shea and the Embers Collective. Stories by Sarah Liza and Rory O'Shea. You can find more about Candlelit Tales on our website, candlelittales.ie and more about the Embers Collective on their website, theemberscollective.com. You can also find them and us on all the usual social media outlets and make sure you check out the Embers Collective podcast on your favourite podcast player. Liking and subscribing to channels really helps us grow and helps them grow. So please give a like and a share and a follow and a subscribe anywhere you find them and us on social media. If you'd like to chip in a few bob for more direct support, you can find us at patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales or make a one time donation through the PayPal button on our website. We love to hear back from you with questions and requests, so please feel free to contact us directly or leave your questions in the comments below. If anything struck you about this, remember we'll be talking to the Embers Collective later this month. So let us know what struck you and we'll bring it up with the guys. What we really want to do is get these stories out there and share them with as many people as possible. So anything you can do to help us, we really appreciate. And we really appreciate you listening.